Okay, David. Uh, what's your definition of primary healthcare? Well, I, I can tell you my understanding of primary health care rather than the definition. Because the definition is written in the Alma Art document. But I understand primary health care to be an approach to health which combines um, health care with addressing social determinants. So the principles of primary health care uh, essentially define these two aspects. So the principles are about equitable access to basic health care, appropriate health care, accessible and participatory and involving other sectors. So the last two principles are really about the social determinant side of primary health care. So primary health care combines basic health care with addressing social determinants. So in some ways, it combines clinical care with public health. Some professional here uh, see that primary health care is very beautiful in developing countries, but because we are very rich and we had uh, technologies, it's something that is, will be not good in a development context. What do you think about it? No, I think that uh, when the World Health Organization and the member states, which number nearly 200, um, agreed to adopt primary health care as a, as a strategy, this included the so-called developed countries as well as the developing countries. So clearly it has application in rich as well as poor countries. I think one of the problems with uh, the Alma Ata document, and there are some contradictions inside the Alma Ata document, is that when it describes the content of primary health care, um, and the content is embedded within what are called the elements or the programs of primary health care. So we have the principles of primary health care, which I've just referred to, and then we have the elements for the programs. Inside the programs, it refers really to only problems of developing countries, uh, which I think is unfortunate. So, for example, much of the content of those elements deals with problems like maternal and child health, problems, infectious diseases and communicable diseases. It does not mention even throughout the Almar document non-communicable diseases. So even at the time of Almar the non-communicable diseases predominated in rich countries. Now, of course, we have an emergence of non-communicable diseases alongside communicable diseases in poor countries. So I think that although it was agreed upon by rich countries, and certainly the principles are applicable in rich countries, and many people have operationalized primary health care in rich countries, there was undoubtedly a focus on the problems and the programs to address those problems which were dominant in poor countries. So in terms of rich countries, what would, should, does primary health care look like? Well I think that the best examples that I am familiar with um, are again examples where there is a combined set of activities which both provide appropriate, basic, accessible health care, particularly at what we call the primary level of care, which is in health centers and clinics, as well as at community level, and combined with addressing some of the social determinants. So we have examples in uh, Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, probably also in other European countries, even in the UK, 
of um, comprehensive health centers, health centers which provide both that care, but also undertake or facilitate community level interventions to address other sectors. So to address social issues in the environment. So that for me is the, if you like, the operationalization of primary health care in developed countries. It seems that we have a um, window of, of, of opportunities in Europe now to implement services based on primary health care because of the economical crisis. Because one of the arguments used is that uh, primary health care is cheaper. So it's enough to advocate for primary health care, the uh, economic side. Yes, I'm not sure that primary health care done properly is cheap. Um, clearly, it is cheaper to provide ambulatory care or outpatient care than to admit a patient to hospital. That is clear. But I think if primary health care is done properly, it can be expensive, although I think in the long term it will reduce costs. So why would it be expensive? Well, it would be expensive, I suppose, because um, if health, the health sector, undertakes or catalyzes actions in other sectors, then clearly that could be expensive. But in the long run, it would incur savings. So let me give a concrete example. I talked yesterday about the problem uh, of obesity and the problems, the health problems resulting from obesity, such as early onset diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even some cancers. So uh, at present, certainly in poor countries, but I would say also in rich countries, the approach to, to, to this set of non-communicable diseases is reactive. You know, providing care to patients who have already acquired these diseases. There is very little intervention from within the health sector to address the determinants of the problem. So some of the determinants can be addressed from within the health sector. Let's call them the behavioral uh, interventions health education and so on, diet control. But to really address these problems, the health sector needs to advocate for other sectors to take action. The other sectors will involve, at least in my country, trade, because the food trade is important, investment, it will involve regulations which are imposed by sectors other than health, of the food environment and so on. So you could say, well, that's a very expensive undertaking. But in the medium to long term, that will reduce the enormous costs of lifelong or for many decades of treatment of diabetes, or heart disease, etc. Combining social determinants of health and uh, in some ways the right to health, uh, primary health care not seem be only a technical issue, but uh, something more. Uh, what the health professional has to do or to learn, or what kind of attitude that they have to promote a real primary health care service and system? Well, clearly, um, both of these aspects providing appropriate, accessible, equitable health care and addressing social determinants are going to require um, a shift in thinking on the part of health professionals. They have to understand that doing both of these is going to require social and political change. Let me explain. If we want to make health care more accessible and more equitable, 
as well as more appropriate, then it's clear that we have to, um, in order to make it more accessible, we have to have provide services much closer to where communities live. So that means that we need outreach and community-based workers in both poor and rich countries. If we are going to make healthcare more equitable, then we have to argue for and get agreement that we will give extra resources to the more unhealthy populations who tend to be the poorest. And if we want to make healthcare more appropriate, then we have to use appropriate technological approaches. So instead of, for example, treating the problem of diarrhea inside a health facility with intravenous fluids, we have to help people to manage the problem of diarrhea at home using oral home fluids. If we want to manage the problem of diabetes, then we have to empower patients to be able to manage it themselves, to understand what dietary and activity aspects they have to undertake themselves. Then on the social determinants side, clearly we will not be able to address the social determinants unless uh, people who use services, who need services, understand the causes of the health problems and usually in medicine we don't deal with this at all. We, we project the, um, I suppose we project the attitude that a health problem is unfortunate or it occurred because you didn't look after yourself properly rather than the health problem is caused ultimately by structural causes, which are located, of course, in the political economy. So if we want to change those things, the food environment, the sanitary environment, the working environment, all of them, and the general environment, which is increasingly polluted with radioactive and chemical contaminants and so on, then clearly People have to understand these things. So that means we have to play an educational, an awareness raising, and an advocacy role. That's political. So it's obvious that uh, primary health care is not just a technical matter. Yes, it is a technical matter, but it's also a political matter in the sense that unless and until power structures which maintain the current political economy, which is breeding ill health and an unequal experience of ill health, until we change that, I think we are not really um, implementing what I would call comprehensive primary health care. So comprehensive primary, primary health care has technical and political components to it. And I think we need to, as health professionals, we need to be able to argue that because there are strong forces who argue, well, politics is nothing to do with us. That's done by the politicians. We are neutral technical people, but we are not neutral technical people because the medicines we choose to use, whether they are generic and cheap or uh, brand medicines which are expensive, the approaches to rehydration that I mentioned earlier that we use, all of these are not technically neutral. They are located within some kind of, in my view, some kind of political uh, analysis. It seems to explain why you are a university professor, but uh, an activist too in people arts movement. Uh, can you explain uh, briefly what People Health Movement is and what is its contribution to primary health care um, spreading or implementing? Well, People's Health Movement is a, really a social movement uh, which attempts to bring together individuals, groups, 
organizations who are in various ways struggling for the right to health. Not just health care, but the right to health. That includes health care, but as I've just described, it includes obviously other sectors as well. So we were formed, People's Health Movement was formed um, at uh, our first assembly, which happened in December 2000. And because the assembly attracted so many people, so much interest, so much enthusiasm, it was decided, well, we can't just have an assembly, we have to try to build a movement. And so we attempted to build a movement. And now, more than 11 years later, we have, I think, the beginnings of the movement. The movement, as you know, is very uneven. In some countries it is quite large and strong and influential, like in India. But in many, many countries, I would say in the majority of countries where we have a presence, we are quite small and embryonic. Um, so we think we have a presence in about 70 countries. In many countries we have no presence at all. We work with and through other organizations which are involved in health, whether it be labor organizations, sometimes NGOs, international NGOs, sometimes local NGOs. And um, we try to organize our activities broadly under the umbrella of the right to health. Now, this can take many different forms. So in India, there's been a quite successful campaign around the right to health care. In South Africa, we are presently organizing around um, a new policy called the National Health Insurance Policy, arguing that that new policy should be public-oriented should not be driven by the private sector because there are some forces that are wanting to use this proposed mechanism to ensure that the private sector gets stronger. So it takes different forms in different countries uh, depending on the issues, the context, and of course ultimately on what sort of capacity we have. If we have very few people it's very difficult to organize a large right to health campaign. All you can do is to try to campaign around a particular issue, which presently is a concern of communities. So um, the right to health campaign really frames our activities. And as you know, we try to um, build our cadres through our International People's Health University, which is a, quite a brief course on political economy and primary health care. And we then try to support those people once they go back to their countries to help them to establish or to strengthen a PHM group in their country. And finally, we're involved in um, some advocacy initiatives at a global level. So we published Global Health Watch, which is now known to be coming from people's health movement, and it um, is a critical analysis of global health policy with some suggestions as to what needs to be done and also some critique of some of the big agencies that are involved in health. And we have other activities as well, but those are really the big activities that we have. Um, we have recently resolved that we are going to spend more time and resources in strengthening our country groups, uh, because sometimes our global activities are stronger than our activities at the national level. And we're also going to focus on two other areas. One is the extractive industries, the mining industry in particular, and also on food sovereignty. And 
need food security. Thank you, David. Uh, um, last uh, question or last thing is that what is your suggestion for us, uh, Italian young health professional and activists, con really genuinely concerned with our population health? Well, I can't really make suggestions for you because you know the context. All I could say is that um, you have to you have to adopt a strategy which is appropriate to your own context. In general, um, though, what we do in countries is uh, we try to. Um, first of all, bring together a group of people who share the same values and perspectives on health. Then we try and understand what are the key and pressing issues around health and health care in our countries, ones that, I suppose, excite the general population and particularly the workers' movement, and then we start to try to organize around that. Usually, because we are a small group, we have to identify allies. So, for example, in South Africa, when we developed this campaign around our national health insurance, which I just described, we decided we're going to do this, and we identified which allies we could work with in other organizations. So we are kind of playing a leadership role, but we are working with other organizations that have an interest and possibly different skills. And then we start to um, we try and raise awareness through public meetings, like the one we had last night, through publications, sometimes articles in the mainstream media, sometimes articles in progressive media, trying to get radio interviews, if we can, about the particular subject, and where appropriate, actually taking action. If there are, for example, a particular um, fora or um, events which are taking place where we feel we need to stay, say something and have a presence. So it's a kind of a combination of, um, I suppose, identifying the issue, trying to broaden um, the group of activists through developing alliances, and then trying to raise awareness and mobilize around particular issues. So in South Africa, we work with some, for example, some organizations that are mobilizing around access to medicines, or um, mobilizing around the issue of sanitation. It's a big problem in South Africa. And saying, well, we need to address not just how the health sector will be funded, but also about some of the, the social determinants. So it really depends on what in Italy are going to be your big issues, but it's clear that with the current crisis in Europe, the capitalist crisis, Italy will not be spared. And things will get more difficult, I'm, I'm certain of that. And it seems to me that you are likely to have um, some impact if you work with the workers' movement and also with the student movement, because those two groups are going to already being affected by the economic crisis, including in their health. Well, thank you again. Hoping to have you soon again in Bologna. Thank you. Thank you.